Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of Franca Icavetta's talk, Public Spectacles of Multiculturalism, Toronto Before Trudeau. It is part of the 2013 History Matters Lecture Series sponsored by the Toronto Public Library. You can find recordings of other talks from the 2013 History Matters Lecture Series and other podcasts at ActiveHistory.ca. I know that the talk was called Public Spectacles of Multiculturalism, uh, Toronto Before Trudeau. Um, and what, I really, what I'm going to talk about is a kind of example of pluralism before Trudeau's kind of vision statement of 1971 and the government policy and so forth. So when I say Trudeau, I really do mean I'm not going to talk about Trudeau um, or about um, policy um, kind of state-directed official multiculturalism, but I will draw some links and I will draw some, um, some patterns, some suggestions from some early attempts uh, uh, at um, uh, uh, experimenting with this liberal ideology that we call um, uh, pluralism and particularly the cultural form of it, uh, of cultural pluralism, which multiculturalism was a term that got increasingly used in the 1960s. Earlier people who promoted the kinds of things that we think of as multicultural tended to call themselves pluralists and cultural pluralists. So in that sense, just so we're all on the same page, I am talking about right people who um, believe in some basic, you know, fundamental principles around this liberal ideology. Um, among them is right that um, it's it, it's conceivable, it's possible, it's even a good thing if we have immigrants uh, uh, um, able to uh, preserve and to celebrate their ethnic customs and traditions and integrate into the mainstream. You know, also right adopt. Uh, the dominant principles. Um, it's the notion that um, a principle of mutual respect for difference, some kind of understanding of difference, that that's a good Canadian value, that's something that right we share as a community. And it's a way also, I'm going to talk more about this, a way also of trying to figure out how do you develop national unity with a diverse population, when the bonds, right, are no longer bonds of race, whether it's the Anglo-Saxon race or the French race, that they're no longer bonds of a shared history because you have increasingly diverse peoples uh, coming in uh, to the country. So those are, um, you know, some of the principles. Obviously, the state multiculturalism or official multiculturalism um, also, right, says officially that we respect these things. We call them Canadian values, right? We call them part of our of notion of a democracy and community. So I'm going to deal with some of those issues. Um, I'm also going to deal largely focus on the cultural pluralism uh, of, uh, um, of liberal pluralism and um, what the cynics call it, right, is the fluff, the fluff of multiculturalism, which is all about food and uh, uh, folk costumes and folk dancing. Um, and I, too, as someone who normally works in labor history and other kinds of histories, first looked at images like this and thought, what do you do with stuff like this? And now I've been trying to uh, make some sense of it. So uh, what do we do with some of the, the food and, and the folk dancing? And I thought I might as well show you some uh, more contemporary uh, images of multiculturalism at work or pluralism at work. Um, what I'm going to do with images um, is uh, because most of the images from my period are black and white, I will show you some of them, but I also thought it was useful to use some more contemporary images because part of what uh, was being encouraged here was the notion that what's colorful, what's celebratory, what's um, uh, fun in a way can draw people right into a kind of intercultural space where you can kind of begin the work of, of you know, getting, to know, uh, getting to know each other. So here are some of the very, um, you know, very recent pictures of multiculturalism. These are some of the same groups um, that I'm going to be talking about as well. So I too have a critique of whether this is the way you want to promote multiculturalism. Um, but what I'm trying to do as an historian um, is to also try to understand uh, why, you know, there were significant numbers of people who did care, right, about um, about these kinds of vehicles, about these kinds of methods for encouraging, you know, greater national unity, for encouraging uh, some of these um, ideas. So, what, as an historian, what I'm doing, and other historians are beginning to do this too, is that rather than focus on that 1971 Trudeau statement, then the state policy, then the legislative frameworks, and all of that, where a lot of political scientists 
have focused um, on, where it's, in some ways it's elite culture, it's about the political machinations of all of that stuff, which is important, but I'm actually interested in looking at whether there are longer routes to multiculturalism? Is there a longer history um, where people try to right, engage in this kind of uh, uh, um, liberal um, uh, activity? I'm also, uh, as an historian, as someone who's a social historian interested in the bottom up uh, of history rather than the top down, um, I'm also interested in seeing whether or not there were um, other kind of more bottom up um, uh, experiments in, in liberal pluralism or in cultural pluralism, or you know, if not necessarily working class up then um, have there been more uh, have there been some community based organizations right closer to the ground uh, where people have been trying to uh, uh, you know engage in some of these ideas um, that we think of as cultural pluralism so I'm looking at uh, other historians are doing this too historians are doing it for the United States right the place where we think it's all about the melting pot um, there too people have found in the past various kinds of experiments um, in liberal pluralism. Why bother doing this? I, my uh, uh, suggestion um, is that um, I think some of these various different experiments may have helped inform late 20th century multiculturalism, including you know, official multiculturalism. Not that they did that in a linear way. I'm not suggesting a nice, easy, Whiggish history from the past through uh, to what we have today, but that, that these things were bubbling up at different times in history, and there kind of was a resurgence of these uh, uh, in later periods. Why bother doing this? I mean, I am someone who wrote immigrant labor histories. Why bother doing this? Um, one of the reasons why um, is I came, up, I came upon uh, the records and images that I'm going to talk about tonight and wanted to try to figure out what they meant. But also, it's partly because the whole issue around multiculturalism and, and what seemed to be a real quick acceptance of Trudeau's visionary statement, um, especially among English Canadians, it was more complicated in Quebec because of Right, because of French Canadian nationalism standing up against Anglo domination in the province and so forth. But it seems, right, when we look at it, that English Canadians, lots of middle class, ordinary English Canadians in places like Toronto, where there were so many uh, immigrants, um, seem to fairly readily accept right, a notion of multiculturalism. And we don't really exactly know why. People have talked about the pluralism that I'm talking about was very much a minority movement for much, much of its history until the late 1960s. And then there is what historians have called a sea change. Suddenly there seems to be a lot of support for multiculturalism. So one of the questions is why? You know, why? Maybe, you know, it didn't just happen overnight, um, but maybe there were things bubbling up um, uh, that were going on. And maybe in a place like Toronto, um, in, you know, English Canadians, Anglo Canadians, who were the dominant population in the city, uh, maybe they got accustomed already to some of these images, to some of the kind of um, pluralist pageantry, the public spectacles, the dances, the intercultural events that, um, that uh, 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 agencies like the International Institute of Toronto. Uh, were trying. They're, 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 they were experimenting with these kinds of methods. So um, I want to explore some of these. Um, one of the criticisms you can make is that I'm making too much of my project, which is what everybody does about their project. But I do think there is something about what these guys were doing and some of their international uh, connections as well. So this project is about something called the International Institute of Toronto. Um, it's a case study of this institute. Um, its origins are the late 40s. There some precursor organizations are formed in the early 1950s, and then in 1956 it becomes the International Institute. Also, what's important about this is that it joins, it's the only group in Canada that joins a much larger American-based international institute movement that had been promoting pluralism since the early 20th century. It joins the International Institute movement. It, international institutes exist in cities across the United States, and since at least the 1920s, were very active promoters of pluralism. Um, and the, the Canadian uh, uh, Institute people, right, join join this movement. So in that sense, right, they are drawing on an even longer history of pluralism, and there's lots of cross-border uh, borrowing that goes on. So I'm going to focus in particular, right, on the cultural mandate of the Institute, though I'll tell you about some of the other activities that they're doing. But among the things, just to make some of the key points that then I want to link to the images and so forth, is that some of the stuff that they're doing uh, in terms of promoting pluralism is
is right, wanting to encourage Canadian appreciation for immigrant talents, immigrant customs, immigrant folklore, this notion that these are kind of gifts right, that the immigrants bring, and if we're, you know, if we're noble about accepting them, then we're all enriched right, by the process. Um, they talk in terms of wanting to promote um, an international community in Toronto, right? Where immigrants, the ethnic Canadians from the earlier waves of immigrants and the Anglo-Torontonians who are very, very important in this, in this uh, uh, scheme, uh, where they begin to think about, right, an international community. They talked about wanting to build a local United Nations in Toronto, which would then be a kind of model for the nation. So there's something you know, around notions of liberalism after the war, United Nations, good liberal causes are also um, part of this. They always were promising, they often couldn't afford it, but they were always promising when they're trying to bring people into their spaces or when they were uh, uh, you know, running performances around the city and so forth, always promising colorful venues, exciting performances, authentic handicraft, foreign adventures, right, right at home, right, this is a lot of what we call uh, domestic tourism, don't have to go any anywhere, but you can go and inhabit, right, these interesting, colorful places, um, and you can learn, right, about, about, you know, other peoples, and isn't that, right, a good and exciting thing. So this is also about trying to encourage a kind of cosmopolitan citizenship in a city by people, many of them are middle class Anglo-Torontonians who I'm talking about, but by people who think, right, we can all be enlightened, right, by these kinds of things. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that I'm going to look at uh, tonight. It's going to be a bit of a scattergun approach with some comments and some imagery, and I hope that uh, uh, it all makes some sense in the end, and you don't have to agree with me at all by the end of the, uh, by the, end of the uh, process. So I'm looking at some of the possibilities, also the limits, also the paradoxes, um, and I'm looking at this place where there's a real mix of people, virtually all white ethnics, but we've got uh, white immigrants, you've got eth ethnic, um, uh, um, ethnic Torontonians, and you also have uh, middle class um, Torontonians, you have women of the local councils of women, the IODE, the Toronto Junior League, you also have uh, a variety of ethnic organizations that are bringing their people in, you also have immigrants who are joining uh, the organization. So there is a kind of ethnic mix, a kind of intercultural space in the Institute. And as I said, I think it's worth doing partly because I think what the Institute was doing was promoting a kind of popular form of multiculturalism. That this is kind of populism at work. It's not about high-minded intellectual debate and principles, but about kind of making it, sending it out to the masses, you know, popularizing it, making it kind of in your face public. Um, so I'm, I am, you know, looking at this kind of Toronto-style public pluralism, um, kind of cavalcade of nations, lots of color. I think there is something very, you know, something Toronto about, about all of this. The other thing I want to stress is that uh, while a lot of what I'm going to show you is, you know, about ethnic customs, there's a certain amount of um, nostalgia about this, romanticizing these cultures that sometimes, right, Canadians uh, uh, saw in patronizing ways about kind of quaint traditions that people uh, were bringing. Uh, but what I think these multiculturalists I'm looking at were trying to do was to harness some of these traditions uh, for what they saw as a very kind of modernist nation building project. That this was about how do we kind of harness all of these uh, cultures in order to move forward, right, in, in terms of questions of national unity. And again, I stress that's, that's what they think they're doing. This is not my position particularly. So the Toronto Institute, let me just say a couple things uh, about it. Um, it is is a product of the Toronto one was formed in uh, the post World War II period. It's operating very much in right that period of mass immigration to Toronto. We've had immigrants coming before then, but this is right the largest unprecedented volume of immigration coming to Canada in the post World War II period. And Toronto was getting more of them than anybody else. Um, lots of British, lots of Americans, but also right lots of, of Europeans in particular. The displaced persons, right the survivors, uh, the volunteer Germans the Italians, um, other kinds of uh, uh, groups as well. And this is the context in which the Toronto Institute is largely doing its work. Um, it's working largely within a white ethnic context, which a lot of people have also pointed out that that's kind of what official multiculturalism in Canada assumed as well. The Institute did try to reach out to what you know they called the new immigrants of the post-67 era, so South 
South Asians coming in, East Asians coming in, Caribbean immigrants. But by the time it's trying to do some of that work, whether it would have done an effective job, I'm not going to say. But by the time it's trying to do that, it itself is falling apart and basically being replaced by some of these new government structures. Um, in terms of the Institute um, various activities, this is an organization. It's uh, working. It's a multilingual social welfare organization. It's a community chest organization that is you know, a United Appeal organization. It's working with non-English speaking immigrants in Toronto. Um, and it's trying to do a number of different things. So again, I don't want to suggest that the only thing it's, do it's doing is what I'm going to focus on, but uh, it is trying to do other things. So it has what we might call a social work aspect to it. So there's lots of concern about uh, job placement, social welfare, um, uh, counseling, uh, 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 clothing, baby layettes, uh, food at Christmas time uh, for people who are out of work. There are, um, there are mental health counselors at the Institute as well. And one thing that is interesting about the Institute is that it is very multilingual. It's the most multilingual place that's delivering immigrant services in Toronto in, in, uh, in this period. So you have social workers who are ethnic Canadian who could speak several languages. You have new immigrants um, who perhaps were doctors back home uh, who can speak five, four and five and six languages. You have people who become social workers who can speak a number of languages and they're working with the immigrants. Also, they are trying to apply some of these pluralist methods uh, to some of the work that they're doing. So there's that aspect. Really important. I don't have time uh, to say more than that. Another aspect is what we might call the settlement house. Um, aspect. So that is the organizing of social activity, educational activity, recreational activity, citizenship classes, um, civics classes. So this is where um, you know, they're, they're running mother's clubs, they're running summer camps for low-income children, uh, they're running uh, hot lunch programs in the schools and so forth. So again, um, that's also a part of what they're trying to accomplish. In those kinds of um, uh, context, they are interested in participatory democracy, getting people right to uh, be involved in various kinds of running of, uh, of the house leagues, of the various organizations. There are various efforts to try to create inter-ethnic organizations so that the hockey league and the soccer league and the mother's club and the supper club and so on and so forth are actually inter-ethnic, right? They were very, very much uh, uh, interested in people not staying within their own group but being, right, being uh, with other groups. So that, that, that's very much part of um, this activity as well. Um, there's also, um, you know, an interesting mix, a paradoxical mix of this kind of liberal democratic discourse and also Cold War discourses there as well. So the Institute said it was non-political, wasn't going to get involved in Cold War stuff, but it did clearly keep out any, anybody who appeared to be left-wing um, and it did form alliances with some of the ethnic groups who were really quite virulently right-wing and virulently communist. But um, and try to sort of maintain a non-political mandate. Okay, and then the third big branch is this cultural pluralism, this attempt to kind of, you know, engage in ways of carrying out a kind of multicultural reimagining of Toronto, right? Toronto is like a British city, right? It's a queen city, heavily Protestant, heavily Anglo, and part of what these, in many cases, middle-class Anglo-Canadians involved in these activities were trying to, right, reimagine Toronto as something more multicultural in light of the new immigration. Some of it, you might say, is defensive. Some of it is about, um, you know, uh, uh, calming anxieties or worries about all these different immigrants coming in. If we have, you know, uh, pieces in place, to try to uh, encourage uh, uh, um, understanding of the groups, uh, encourage interaction, then you know, this, this can be useful. Um, some of the people involved, the director was Nell West for a long time. She was uh, a Canadian, lots of welfare experience. She was a University of Toronto, Chicago uh, trained social worker. So she actually was trained by some of the American pluralists. Um, so she's drawing on some of their ideas. There were people like um, um, uh, Harold Forbel, who actually was a military man. Uh, uh, who would run a, a, a multinational um, NATO uh, unit at one point. There was Tina Stewart, who was someone who was a very a veteran volunteer, classic kind of middle class woman volunteer in Toronto with the IODE and other kinds of women's organizations. Um, these people saw themselves as cultural ambassadors who were right, going to try to build this local United Nations. Um, and they thought right, that they could try to do this. Now, to some extent, they are doing 
uh, uh, carrying out activities, carrying out approaches um, that did draw on this longer tradition of the American International Institute movement, which as I said, the Toronto Institute joins. Um, and this institute, I want to tell you a little bit about it, partly because Canadians are often smug about saying, you know, that they had a they have a they have a more liberal record on immigrants than do than do the Americans. Uh, but the American International Institute um, was something that emerged out of early 20th century progressive era reforms in the United States. Um, it emerged out of the YWCA movement where right, the Young Women Christians Association uh, staffers and workers were working with a lot of single women in the cities. Um, they also, of course, noticed that many of the single women in the cities were actually uh, uh, immigrant daughters of immigrant families, became increasingly interested in trying to do more with the immigrant families, bring them into uh, their spaces, and so they ended up creating this whole new movement called the International Institute. The first one created in New York City in 1910 and then it spread. Lots and lots of institutes across uh, the United States and by the 1920s there's about 50 of them and Buffalo, Philadelphia, Boston, New York, Los Angeles, so on and so forth. Um, and these are people who are pushing a very minority position, pluralism, and they're doing so in the face of opponents who are either of the melting pot kind um, or of what, what were often called the 100% Americanizers, who were the absolute assimilate, you know, everybody turned them into Americans. And they were experimenting with a number of um, uh, uh, methods that the Toronto Institute um, uh, borrowed, and some of the things that I just said were among them. Um, they were very much um, adopted something that's been known as a kind of immigrant gifts approach to pluralism and that is this notion of talking about the immigrants as people who bring these interesting uh, uh, gifts, these interesting cultural gifts, their, their folklore music, their, uh, their dance, their quaint traditions, their interesting uh, traditions and that, that becomes a place you know, for uh, uh, making uh, 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 some connection. That the, you know, the host societies that accept them, that understand them, will be enriched by them. Now, you can say to me what they're not talking about necessarily is changing class divisions or inequities in society, but they're, right, they have this kind of notion. Um, so just to give you, uh, so they, they're often been referred to as if promoters. That was their kind of their, their pitch, right, for, uh, for pluralism. And they included um, people who, um, the head of the Buffalo International Institute said things like, immigrant talents are to be poured into the ever-changing framework of American life, not to be remade, um, uh, not to be poured into a certain mold. The spice of life is diversity. Um, those who bring their many gifts and endowments will create something new through the fusion of their talents, their homes, their aspirations. We will lay down the foundations of love and understanding. That's liberal, idealistic, um, and those are the things that they uh, uh, were trying to implement. The Toronto Institute folks were also very much uh, immigrant gifts promoters. Uh, they talk all the time about uh, immigrant talents and cultures as gifts that are going to enrich the Canadian mosaic. Uh, they talk about, they use lots of mixed metaphors, but they talk about the Canadian treasure chest Right, is this kind of expansive treasure chest that will, right, um, if it will come and, and, and kind of absorb um, a whole, whole lot of different cultures, then right, everybody is enriched by it. Um, they also spoke, and I think this is one of the places where they really were trying to promote something uh, quite significant. They did speak about um, this is something that everybody needs to do. It's not only about the immigrants kind of integrating, but what we need to do is find a way of making better citizens, more enlightened citizens of everybody, of the new immigrants, the ethnic Canadians, and Anglo-Canadians, that, you know, that this kind of mingling had to take place. There's a lot of emphasis on showcasing ethnic talent, folk culture, to encourage ethnic mingling, um, but also uh, there's a lot of emphasis on how the Anglo-Canadians have to be part of this process, um, otherwise it's not going to work. Um, the ideas and the suggestions that these institute folks used um, also don't just draw on this American Institute movement that goes back to the early 20th century, but also it fits with the history of various kinds of experiments uh, in Canadian history as well. Um, there have been earlier um, uh, experiments with cultural pluralism, with a mosaic ideology from the early 20th century. Again, it is a minority movement, uh, but you have the number of examples where um, middle-class Anglo-Canadians uh, were interested Right, in notions of 
ethnic distinctiveness of promoting this is something that can also promote uh, a sense of wider national unity. An example from the late 1920s and 1930s are ethnic festivals that were promoted by the CPR and their head publicist, J. Murray Gibbons, uh, who was someone who was a very much a cultural entrepreneur uh, and who popularized the term of cultural mosaic, though he took the, took the term from an American writer. Um, but he, too, uh, very interested in promoting, you know, using public spectacle, using pageantry, using colorful costumes in order to create, um, you know, this space, in order to use it as a, a national unity tool in a population that was becoming increasingly diverse. So, again, this is idea of how do you how do you build national unity um, when you have diverse peoples with diverse histories and, and, and diverse ways of understanding things. Um, other examples I could talk about, um, but I'm going to jump back to the post-World War II period and say that the Toronto Institute in the face of all of this uh, new immigration is also just, you know, trying to uh, uh, play with some of these ideas, um, is trying to implement some of these ideas. They're not the only ones doing it, other people are doing it, there are various community experiments in Montreal, um, the, the ruling liberals of the day are doing it, right, Paul Martin and the New Canadian Citizenship Act of 1947 is partly about how do you create national unity when your population keeps getting more and more diverse, right? When when, uh, when you have to find uh, a way of, of bringing people together. And his, right, his suggestion uh, was that you make things like mutual respect, uh, understanding, tolerance, Canadian values, right? That that becomes the thing uh, that Canadians use. My focus is on these, uh, these uh, institute uh, immigrant gifts pluralists who were trying to push this uh, populist pluralism um, and who also did it often in very kind of eclectic contexts. So I'm going to try to give you some clear analysis of, the, uh, of some of these images and ideas, but it's also complicated because sometimes what's going on is all over the place and there's sort of eclectic events where there's so much going on that it's hard to figure out exactly uh, what's happening. And it did seem that whenever the Institute didn't know what to do, they'd say, well, let's just have a parade. You know, we'll get all the ethnic groups to dress up in their colorful costumes and parade down Young Street and that would be great. So there is this kind of you know, difficult sometimes uh, to figure it out. But I think um, this quotation I want to read you from one of the, the directors of the Institute, I think does give a sense of this immigrant gifts strategy that's behind it and also of this notion that we can harness these ethnic folklore traditions to a modern nation building project. So let me just um, uh, uh, read this and that, you know, the Anglo-Canadians have to be involved. Um, so we talked about um, the uh, you know, smaller single group folk events had their role, uh, but everyone's best interests were served when these artistic and cultural talents were enjoyed by all ethnic groups, by immigrants, by new Canadians, and by old Canadians. It is in fact attendance by old Canadians uh, at functions of this kind that the greatest good can be achieved for all concerned. Artistic and cultural talents with which the various ethnic groups are so richly endowed, that was a recurring phrase, um, should not be preserved like diamonds in a jeweler's vault, nor reserved for the few, but rather be used and exercised nationally, and, and in so doing they will grow and take on a new vitality. They may retain the some of the significance of the country of origin, but they will take on new and meaningful interpretations of this land, and they will help us uh, build a nation. So you get a sense of that kind of nostalgia and, and modernity at the same time. So let me um, show you some of these images. First, I wanted to um, give you a sense of the American International Institute movement and what it's doing already in the 1920s. So this notion of all nations, pageants and so forth is very much uh, part of their strategy. Um, it also in the 20s and 30s was used in, in schools and synagogues and churches. There's something that was referred to as a, a cultural gifts movement uh, uh, in the United States, which then is stopped by the war when like patriotism becomes uh, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the main issue, but then a resurgence after the Second World War. So here is a 1950s American example of the uh, All Nations Parade. So again, um, you know, the Americans are doing it too. They're, a, they're in a minority position until the late 60s and 70s as well, but they're there too. And there are real connections between uh, the institutes and uh, the Toronto people have connections uh, to the Americans. Um, some of the people trained in the American institutes work at the Toronto Institute. Some of the um, uh, social workers who were first volunteers go to the United States to become social workers in pluralist methods. So you get, um, you know, you get this, this growth of a kind of pluralist
pluralist uh, 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 professionalizing of, of pluralist ideas. So these are some of my uh, institute people, and as I said, um, there are lots of women volunteers, there are lots of immigrants or ethnic Canadians, and they're doing a variety of things. Some of them look small scale, some of them are bigger scale. Um, so this is an example of, uh, um, among the many things that they did, Sunday afternoon teas, that might be a fundraiser, but that almost always, um, they either happened at the institute itself or they happened in the homes of some of these wealthy middle class women who were the volunteers, and almost always they had sort of what I call the pretty ethnic uh, women in costume uh, who were part of the process. They were always there, um, and on one level we could say that this is a classic example of promoting pluralism as non-threatening, right? This is female, feminine embodiment of, plur of uh, pluralism. Don't worry about it. These are lovely women in their lovely um, outfits on the left. Budapest, Hungarian, and uh, Italian um, um, on, on your right. Um, but we can say that, but they also were supposed to have a kind of role as nationality workers, and partly what they were supposed to be doing was encouraging conversation across cultures, right? Putting people at ease, telling them about their cultural customs so that the other might tell them about theirs, and in that sense, right, be part of this kind of mingling and, and mutual respect. Um, another example here, which is also interesting because we don't see very many immigrants of color emerge in the institute records, but here is uh, here is uh, someone who is uh, in costume as well, in uh, Jamaican costume, and then the woman to the right, who's the more common kind of figure in, in, in these images and records I kept coming across in the archives, um, who's in a Dutch national costume. Now, this is um, a Save the Children fundraiser. And again, on the one hand, we can sort of make light of this and say, oh yeah, you know, they've got the, they've got the pretty you know, ethnic girls out in their costume. The Institute actually had files that were lists of pretty ethnic girls of all different ethnic nationalities in Toronto. And they would phone them up. Or if they couldn't find somebody, they would ask like the, uh, the, the, you know, the Greek organization or the Latvian handicraft organization or somebody say, find me some pretty girls right, that we can put uh, in costume. So it's easy to make fun, and I don't have a problem doing that. But on the other hand, what's also interesting is that these people are involved in what are classic liberal causes of the post-war period. Right? This is Save the Children Fund. Uh, they did the same kind of thing for uh, uh, United Nations Day, for Citizenship Day, for Citizenship Week. Um, and so partly what was going on was a promotion of those kinds of post-war values, internationalism, right? a belief in the United Nations, a notion that if people talk out their issues, if they get to know each other, then right, we might have a, a less violent world. Right? So there are those kinds of um, principles that are operating here as well. You can decide you know, whether I'm reading too much into this picture or whether it's sort of all part um, of the story. Now, some of the uh, other things the Institute did was uh, it was very keen on what we, uh, uh, some historians have called kind of domestic uh, tourism or exotic tourism uh, in your own city, and that is they would um, set up an old world bazaar or a European market, and then they would right, invite people to come and say, you know, come to this new carnival, come to this old world market, and, um, you know, have, have fun, right? Have fun and learn things. So just an example of some of the flyers that they would, they would use would be things like, come one, come all to the old world bazaar, sample foods from foreign lands, uh, get a gypsy to tell your fortune, feel rich by joining a millionaire's club by gambling a fortune in dollars, which of course were really only pennies, uh, play a chancy game of tombola, uh, buy a Christmas gift, you know, a unique handicraft gift uh, for your friends and family and be the talk of the town. So there's a certain amount of, you know, that kind of thing going on as well. At the end of these bazaars, they might go on for a weekend and everyone was supposed to get together on the dance floor and learn some folk dancing. Uh, uh, you know, change partners, right, and, and, and engage in this kind of, of cultural uh, exchange. So some of the kinds of things, though, that they were showing were also meant to, right, be instructional, be, be helpful. And so uh, among the things they would say is, you know, come and see handmade, you know, Polish dolls. Come and see beautifully handcrafted Latvian dolls that were, you know, ancient traditions that were being uh, brought to us, right, that were, were part of uh, this new uh, Canadian heritage. So uh, things like Polish handmade dolls, there's another Polish handmade doll, uh, a Latvian um, handmade doll uh, as well, and the ubiquitous embroidery. Um, all of these events always had said, come and buy some Ukrainian embroidery, come buy, uh, uh, some, buy, buy, buy some uh, uh, festive uh, material that you can bring home. So 
those kinds of activities are happening as well. Um, another classic <clears throat> example is of this sort, which is my black and white version of what I began with, but right, lots and lots of folk dancing performances, lots of folk music performances, lots of orchestral uh, performances. Um, some people have... Um, you know, certainly talked about this notion of the immigrants are on display. That partly what the institute is saying, look, you know, these are pleasing symbols of pluralism. And if we as Anglo-Canadians, right, attend them, appreciate them, learn something about their culture, then, right, we're kind of consuming uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of pleasant form uh, of pluralism. Um, and that's, that's fine as far as it goes, but it's also clear that the ethnic groups themselves were very interested in doing this work. And I don't think it's because they were just duped by the Toronto Institute, but because they had an investment in these kinds of forms of commemorating uh, uh, their history, of commemorating who they were, and also that they were using the Institute as much as the Institute was using them. Any public platform, right, for, you know, putting their public presence um, on sort of the, the map uh, was, was used and used all the time. The Institute could not have put on these kinds of performances with these costumes and so forth, if the ethnic cultural groups, if the folk groups, the folk art groups, the folk dancing troops and so forth didn't participate, if the ethnic elites who run uh, the organizations didn't say, yeah, I want you to go and do this, do as much of it as you can. They asked institute people to come to their own events. Um, they were always um, interested in being able to perform. And clearly what they're doing is what some historians have called cultural assertion, right? That they are making their presence known and they want want right, a say in how um, this kind of pluralism uh, gets developed and you do, I increasingly see by the 1960s, right, the discussion about the third force, right, that immigrants are the third force in Canadian society. So that's going on as well. Another thing the Institute was very keen on, and again this goes back to, this is why I I made a point of talking about kind of participatory democracy, settlement house kind of stuff because it wasn't enough just to see performances. They were also very keen on workshops where people actually, you know, engaged in right these dances and so forth. So this whole issue about you learn about dances from another land, you learn a little bit about the history of that land, you try out their dances, you try out somebody else's dances. Everybody gets, you know, everybody everybody actually is moving, is active, and it's a kind of you know grassroots participatory democracy that they're partly talking about. So here um, they're um, trying to learn their dances and then I've snuck in a more contemporary picture because again I think what, what the black and white doesn't show is the color. And again the, the, the costumes become really important. Right? They're very concerned that the colorful ethnic regalia, the colorful ethnic costumes um, are there. Um, here's another um, strategy the Institute used. It introduced something called ethnic weeks um, as a pluralist strategy and what these um, were um, I should say about the workshops that if people didn't dance with each other, if they didn't break out of their groups, the institute people got really annoyed, right? They'd say, these people only want to dance with their own people. We have to go in there, t break them apart, make them dance, you know, with the other groups. So that was something that they talked uh, about as well. These ethnic weeks, um, this, is this is a Hungarian ethnic week, uh, 1963. Um, this is Mayor Somerville of Toronto, who was a folklorist, I mean, very much in favor of folklore, folklore preservation. Um, he's, he's involved in various attempts to build folk community um, organizations that become important in the 60s in Canada. And she's one of these right Hungarian um, attractive ethnic women. And I particularly like this, this picture because I think it captures part of what I'm saying about that um, seemingly paradoxical uh, contradiction between uh, the traditional ethnic costume and the 60s beehive at the same time. So this mix between the past and the modern um, is, I think, um, um, uh, uh, evident in lots of places. What happened with these ethnic weeks is that they would usually be, you know, they'd be the whole the whole week, they might begin with a kind of afternoon uh, tea, then there would be some kind of formal um, um, aspect to it. Um, this is, Somerville is going to cut the ribbon um, uh, for what is an arts and crafts display. It has some high art painting, it also has folklore painting, you can see the sculpture there as well. And then the rest of the week would be a whole series of activities that are all about showcasing the ethnic group being, um, you know, being celebrated, and the idea was to bring as many different people as you could into the institute to take in these um, events. So there would be lectures about 
the history. There would be folk dancing and folk demonstrations. There would be the handicraft dolls. Um, and the idea was to kind of keep coming back over the course of the week. And it was all supposed to end with a grand ethnic banquet, which was always described in, by using colorful, uh, colorful language. Um, so there. Um, that kind of activity is going on. Um, the Institute is also, um, uh, again, very, very concerned that the, those different groups, the different elements come, so they would ask the ethnic organizations to bring their people. They'd ask the local council of women and all the various middle class women's organizations to drag their people into the Institute, because lots of times um, they, didn't, they never quite got the mix that they wanted, uh, but they were trying uh, to do that. So there's a lot of attempts to you know, get different peoples into uh, the Institute. The other thing I'm going to say, I don't have time to say very much about this, but the Institute's emphasis in many ways was kind of the folk thing, right? It was the folk tradition, the, you know, the songs about the peasantry, national songs about soldiers, and so on and so forth. But we should keep in mind um, that in many cases what we're talking about are performances uh, by people who are performing, you know, what we might consider classical music. Um, this is Kodaly, who was Hungarian uh, a composer of, um, of uh, folk music, but he also was a classical trained composer. And uh, there's, a, there's an irony here in some cases, because these orchestras or these pianists or singers would perform what were perceived to be folk music, but they themselves were class classically trained. Right? Especially in terms of the Eastern Europeans and others who were in the displaced persons camps uh, and then come to Canada. And their view of, of Canada was that it was a Philistine place, that there was no high art, uh, that there was, you know, culturally it was itself quite backward. So you end up in this sort of, again, a funny dynamic that I don't have enough time to talk about. But here, an example of the colorful banquet that uh, is going uh, is going to happen, the Latvian Easter table, um, you know, again, come, come to the, come to the Latvian, um, uh, in, to the Institute. Um, there was an attempt to deal with other uh, groups. There was an attempt, there's an Indonesian night, there's a couple of other nights, but I found very, very little about it. Um, but I, I did find some information about Japanese night, which I find is interesting because what they're doing here is actually reaching out to Japanese Canadians. So they're not an immigrant group, um, but as many of you know, right, Japanese Canadians were dispersed across the country after uh, the evacuation of the war. Um, and so in some ways they're treating the Japanese like immigrants. They will treat also Aboriginal uh, 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 Canadians like immigrants as well. So their handicrafts get brought into the Institute. This notion that they too have to make this transition to uh, Canadian society uh, is happening. This is a folk festival. The Institute was very keen on folk festivals. Uh, I just want to uh, give you a bit of a description of the kind of thing that was going on at these folk festivals. This is just outside Toronto. Um, lots and lots of different ethnic groups. The Mazdens were 1920s Danish immigrants that become very big folk promoters. They're very actively involved in a kind of semi-professional circuit of people who are getting hired and going to various places and performing in all of these places. And this is an example to give you a sense of the eclecticism, which makes it sometimes hard to figure out really uh, what they thought uh, was going on. So here's a description. Uh, it began with two marching bands, including the pipes of drum and drums of Scotland. Then performers all in traditional dress took to the stage. The Asian Court International Folk Dance Group performed very gay dances from many lands, including Poland, England, and the Italian Tarantella. There were Scottish country dances, a medley of Serbian line dances, Danish-Canadian folk dances, and a Ukrainian troupe who performed colorful, strenuous, and gay dances from around the Black Sea, and an Austrian duet played the zither and guitar. A group of Iroquois Indians from the Six Nations of Brantford, Ontario, performed some chief Hiawatha traditional dances familiar to those of our own Indians in Ontario. The lilting gayness of Scandinavian dances performed by the Buffalo International Institute Dance Group, a Norwegian-Canadian dance couple, the Mazden School Dancers, uh, the folk singers included the High a Highland Scots group, a Dutch choral group from Toronto and Hamilton who sang songs telling of the peasant life and gay times past. A few French Canadian folk dances and songs. The Hungarian 80 youth dancers performed a traditional wedding dance. There was an Israeli dance group, an Italian choir, an Austrian youth group of new Canadians who performed the gay, lighthearted dances of their native Austria. Um, and it goes on and on, right? So there's a kind of, you know, the kaleidoscope of color and, and, and sometimes seems to be the point um, at the same time as I'm trying to kind of figure out some of the meaning uh, behind this. 
Um, and certainly as we go into the 60s, there is a lot of emphasis on more public, more spectacle, more colorful. People like Forbel at the Institute are saying, we've now had enough immigration that we've collected lots of cultural treasures. We've got all sorts of immigrants with all sorts of uh, traditions, so let's put them out there in bigger places. So the CNE grandstand show, Labor Day weekend in Toronto in the 60s, has um, these kinds of, of pageants, uh, something called Nation Builders uh, at uh, the CNE. This one is a nation builders ball that was taking place the night before at the Royal York Hotel and again you see right that all the ethnics are in costume and the one angle guy is in right in, in uh, civilian dress so to say um, and again you know colorful uh, descriptions about uh, their colorful um, costumes um, I like this one too again because of the, uh, of the dynamic so that she's in she's in her ethnic dress um, and uh, she's dancing with this fellow without dress, and it refers to uh, women in the background seem somewhat dismayed by Helga Seibold and Booby Kruger obviously enjoying their version of the twist of the Saturday ball. So you see these um, uh, uh, ethnic women in the background. So again, this mix of, of tradition and modern. Um, another event the Institute is involved in, I mean it's not the, the leader by any means, but is very involved in is um, the Metro Caravan, Metro International Caravan of the late 1960s. And here's um, right, an example of, of uh, uh, um, an Italian uh, uh, immigrant woman with her pizza at the Italian pavilion. And one of the things that's interesting about Metro Caravan, that in a sense it is domestic tourism and popular pluralism brought to a higher level. Because what you literally did was, right, you bought a passport um, and you bought a passport that allowed you to go visit pavilions, different ethnic pavilions around the city and you'd get your passport stamped and you'd actually go in and observe right, the dancing or eat the food or go to the Irish pavilion and go to the pub and drink beer or do whatever it is that you wanted to do. But the idea was right, that you were kind of like the European traveler. right? You were going off to these places uh, while still safely at home and that you were becoming enlightened, right? an enlightened, more cosmopolitan city, uh, a citizen as, uh, as a, a result of it. Um, and that, you know, caravan goes on for right, almost 30 years, I think. It's more than 30 years that it's around uh, in Toronto. Five. And uh, here's another Metro uh, Caravan Ukrainian sailor dance in 1974. And this is a very classic example of the kind of pavilion that you would go into, right, and then take in uh, what was going on. Um, I'm going to just shift very briefly to one other side of the story, which is you know, I'm very much focused on the role that the immigrants were playing and the Canadians were kind of the consumers, appreciative consumers of it. But there were also um, strategies for um, teaching the immigrants about Canadian uh, uh, history and about Canadiana and also trying to do it partly through um, kind of public spectacle. So the Institute ran something called Canadiana Weeks. Uh, every September uh, for a week in format very similar to the ethnic weeks that I described except this time Canadiana uh, was on display and they used um, you know items, they used historical pageantry, they used theatre, they used music um, in order to you know uh, uh, basically tell, um, tell Canadian history but tell a particular version of it. This notion, what's really um, operating here is this notion that you know, if once we were intolerant of diverse peoples we've become more tolerant um, and we now respect and we th therefore have a better future. Another kind of line was that we, you know, Canada is more diverse than the immigrants might realize. You know, we have different peoples, different cultures, different customs and you know, this is a past that we need to retrieve and then move forward with it. These history lessons did include, right, didn't include things like the Chinese head taxes or right, uh, you know, uh, not very positive aspects about Canadian history. So it's what we call you know, a selective uh, kind of um, uh, version of history. So some of the things they used, uh, the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario, then the Toronto um, Art Gallery uh, lent paintings from their Canadiana section uh, to put on display at the Institute. So Cornelius Kriegel's Habitant Sw uh, uh, Slaying is obviously a very romantic notion of the Canadian past, but they also used Emily Carr, so bold uh, modern uh, uh, paintings were used to also talk about right, this bold country, this modern country that's happening. They were very keen on the group of seven and I see the group of seven uh, 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 prints over here um, and I to say that the Toronto Public Library also lent materials to the Institute, uh, books, 
um, and other things that, again, were to be part of these sort of uh, Canadiana lessons. This is uh, an example of Canadian handicrafts that would be brought into the Institute. The Grenfell Mission, which was in Labrador, uh, had a, a tradition of uh, handicraft making, uh, descendants of English and Irish settlers, also Inuit uh, in the area, and again, uh, colorful representations right, of uh, a colorful past. So these, the famous hooked rug from Grenfell Mission would be brought in. It's another example of the hooked rugs um, Grenfell Inuit bookends, and again, the whole issue around ways in which um, Aboriginal handicrafts were sort of made immigrant uh, is an interesting uh, uh, dynamic I can't talk about. Um, the quilts, uh, loyalist quilts, United Empire loyalist quilts were brought in as a way then of being able to talk about who the loyalists were right in the making of Canada, and there was a lot of use of this kind of thing, romantic, hero heroic notions uh, of the Canadian past. Um, they used um, uh, uh, all sorts of paintings from the Confederation Life Insurance Company that had this gallery, right, of heroic renditions of the Canadian past, like Cabot and the, and the flag. Um, and again, those were used partly to say, you know, Canada's still a young country, it's a rich country, we still you know, have to make our future and that we can make it together. Um, I think there are all sorts of flaws and contradictions and problems uh, with the kinds of things that they were trying. Uh, but I, as someone you know, who, who uh, uh, didn't take this kind of stuff seriously at all before, um, I've been trying to make sense of, of it um, uh, uh, in these kinds of ways. Though in the end, what in some ways is the most striking is the eclecticism of it all. And I still don't quite have a handle on what that means, except for you know, the more color, the more you bring people in, and then maybe the more meaningful things you can do with it. I'll stop there. You've been listening to a recording of Franca Ecovetta's talk, Public Spectacles of Multiculturalism, Toronto Before Trudeau. It is part of the 2013 History Matters Lecture Series sponsored by the Toronto Public Library. You can find recordings of other talks from the 2013 History Matters Lecture Series and other podcasts at activehistory.ca.